Hey, it's Max, the original Flowgrammer. And this is the studio, the show where I share the stories of Flowgrammers across NFN's global community. Cryptocurrencies, by their nature, exist on a blockchain. A blockchain is a publicly inspectable ledger. Inherently, that means it's scrapable. The same is true for its websites, related GitHub projects, documents, white papers. It just so happens that there's a great work for automation tool that's good at scraping and transforming that kind of data and has some AI functionalities to process that, aggregate it, and do some useful stuff. And that's why Nikita, a work for automation consultant, used NITN to build a crypto project vulnerability tracker for one of his clients. His client uses insights from that report to create hyper-personalized cold outreach to those crypto projects for his own business. Given that with AI, there's even more cold emails and outbound and a lot of people doing it badly, as you can imagine, a hyper-personalized cold email citing your own crypto project and a real vulnerability on that project is definitely going to convert higher than your average AI personalization. However, as with most NITM flows, tweak the source app, freak some logic, and you've got a completely different use case. For example, a Craigslist arbitrage bot. I'm doing this thing where I'm floating use cases that I don't have time to build in hopes that someone does. Let's hear more about it from the man himself. Nikita's one of these guys again. I'm on LinkedIn and I see folks building with NNN and I'm kind of reading on the use case. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. But would you mind introducing yourself, everyone? My name is Nikita. I run an AI automation agency called Intelscale, where we create AI agents automations for businesses to increase revenue, save time, or just help them scale. We're of AI agents and automation because they're very powerful right now and you should definitely use them. Absolutely. I mean, you're preaching to the choir here <laughs> as a guy who works at NNN. Nikita, give everyone a little context. How long have you been around doing this? How many clients do you have? Just kind of for a bit of context. Yeah, well, essentially, I used to be a developer and AI engineer, machine learning engineer, and I kind of switched to building no-code automations, make this common, then switch to NAN. This just makes more sense. It's way faster to build automations for businesses. We've helped over 15 or 20 businesses from anything from small businesses to eight-figure companies, help them scale and increase revenue. Very cool. In 2025, what are the kinds of use cases that you're seeing are like production ready, you're getting inbound requests? for, you know, what are those trends? Content is big. We've had a lot of requests to build full content production systems, anything from idea generation, doing research on competitors and seeing what successful posts they make, getting ideas from that, and then actually generating the content and the style of the client using fine-tuned models and that sort of stuff. Big problem that businesses have in general is not doing follow-ups or not doing them automatically. Even like eight-figure companies are not doing that enough. That's kind of a big thing that it pretty much increases the revenue of the business immediately once you automate that stuff. Anything, you know, client-related, doing research on clients automatically because AI is very powerful. You can do a lot of research, get insights about the customer like, or the clients, just be able to communicate with them better. So these are the main two. Obviously, there's like, many things that go beyond it. Thanks a lot for the insight. It makes a lot of sense. And fine tuning is something in Q1 I plan to explore a little bit. So I might be hitting you up with a few questions or, or a collaboration idea, because I think there's a lot of scope basically for just small models, like all of these customers, they have training data in their systems. It's just not in the yeah. right format. Without further ado, Nikita, could you give us a little bit of context on what you're going to be showing us today? Actually, we had a client. He does research on new crypto projects, and then he finds vulnerabilities in these projects, and then he helps these teams solve these bottlenecks. One of the things that he wanted to do is scrape and find new crypto projects and then do research on them. Then generate a summary of the project and then generate a personalized message to the crypto project team with the vulnerabilities of the project that can potentially happen just with some personalization. The main thing is the scraping, the research and the analysis of new crypto projects. Makes sort of sense. It's like a, a cold outreach use case, mm -hmm. but I think like hyper relevant. If I got an email to my inbox and someone has this vulnerability well, and I even recognize some of my code base yeah. or something there is something that we have, that's got yeah. my attention. Would you mind sharing your screen and showing us this use case? There are multiple flows and I'll show you the main ones that do the actual lifting. The first flow here, it finds new crypto projects on one of the sources that we use. There's essentially two sources. This is one of them. There's a duplicate flow for another source, just literally the same, but just uses a different scraper. So essentially we just 
trigger the flow. Actually, we don't use a custom scraper. We just scrape directly from the source and then we get the project. If you want to look at the output, it looks something like this. We get the date of the project, its name and some other information. And then we are checking for the new project that we already have on Google Sheets, making sure that there are no duplicates and just removing any duplicates and merging everything together. Then we check if the project is actually new, if it's not a duplicate, if it exists, if everything is okay, and we add it to Google Sheets. And this one little code block, if you're interested, this we're just using it for debugging purposes when we want to only return the first item, the second item, only the first five items, block there and just that says take the first five or the last five. So we add it to Google Sheet. The fun part begins. We start to analyze the project, we start to get social links from it. I prep an input for the next module, which just gets the website link, the source, and the name of the project. We're using a different tool with a custom scraper that finds the social links. So like the Twitter website, maybe there's a documentation link, that sort of stuff. I got you. That's a separate workflow that basically gets that information, goes, does the research yes. on that specific like, context in there. Yeah? Yes, exactly. This is a very simple workflow because it's using a custom scraper that we wrote on Python and deployed. It would just call the link, get retrieve this information and re return it to this module. Then we have a little step that just checks if the data is missing, if not, if it exists or not. After that, we use just an OpenAI module uh, step to restructure the social links, find the ones that we actually care about, the website link, GitHub link, Twitter, email if they have it. Just use AI to restructure the data and put it into Google Sheets again. That's how so if we just get the data, if show the prompt, we just ask it to create a JSON string with the output here. And then we'll update Google Sheets with the information. Interesting part begins. We prepped the data for the next module. We just get the social links and the namespace. And then we call the research the project module which is a custom workflow, which is actually a research agent that we've built. If I go to this tab, you should be able to see it. It has access to three tools. All of them are custom scrapers that we've built and deployed. There's essentially three steps. The first step is when the social links include a link to documentation. This is the main source of information we want to get from the crypto project. If social links here include the link to the documentation, the AI agent will use one of the tools to get all of the information from the documentation. It will use this automatic content scraper to go to the website, get all of the links, scrape all of them, and then go to each link and scrape all of them again. It's very deep. It gets so much information. You built a, a recursive web scraper, basically, a custom exactly. recursive web scraper. Is that in, in Python? It's in Python, yeah. This is for like deep analysis. But then if there is no documentation link, what the agent does next is it uses another tool, uh, just a simple HTTP tool that retrieves all of the links from the website. Sometimes, as you see here, there's no links. It just does not return anything. But sometimes there's a hundred links and it needs to analyze all of them and see what links might indicate that they have documentation in them. If they didn't have documentation, AI agent will find the link and use again this recursive scraper to get all of them and then store the content for later analysis. If the documentation is not found, what it's going to do is just use another scraper, which does not have recursion. It works on like a manual basis. We just provide a list of links that we want to scrape. It will scrape all of them and just combine the data into one big chunk of text. It uses this tool, just provides the links, understands what links to use, and then just stops. In case that there is no links provided, like just in the case, as we see here, it will use the automatic recursive scraper on the main link of the website. It will go through all of the links and scrape all of the content. Yeah, sometimes, you know, this HTTP tool that retrieves links, sometimes it does not work. So we have just multiple ways for the AI agent to kind of route itself. In the last resort, if like everything fails, if there's no content, the website does not work or something, they deleted the website, it will use uh, the overview page page from the source that we're scraping it from, and it'll just get the you know, overview information and store it as well, the main workflow of this agent. It's interesting. I've seen a few other users when they're talking about prompting oh. best practices talk about, you know, having an escape hatch yeah. for your AI agent. It's kind of seeing that premise here, you know, like when things don't go right, which when you're giving an yeah. autonomy, you know, could be yeah. the case, define what that yeah. looks and like. And some of the tips, if you are actually creating prompts for AI agents, use AI to create prompts as well. What I did is I just went to Claude and I explained everything that I wanted to do and just ask it to create a good, like well-written prompt. Just spits out a very detailed prompt that actually works because sometimes when you do it, it's not necessarily what actually works for AI agents. Can I ask in Claude, are you using the prompt writing assistant tool or are you just using vanilla Claude? Yeah, I'm just using the vanilla Claude. Free pro tip for everyone at home. Do you use LLMs to help write your prompts? 
Yes, all the time. I use AI for pretty much everything right now. Guilty is charged as well. Yeah. yeah. If when I look at the outputs here, we see that we start the AI agent, then it sees that there is no link in the documentation. But there is no documentation link in the social links here. Then it uses the HTTP scraper to find all of the links on the website. It sees that there is no content, doesn't then reply, but it will use the main link of the website, use the recursive scraper and find all of the information here. And this is actually a good use case because as you see here, it did not find any information. I think that's because the website does not exist anymore or there's some issues with the website. What it did in that case, it used the manual scraper, that's the edge case, and it just used it on the overview page of the crypto project. This guy, that's showing you all of the three steps that could go wrong. I yeah. think they did go wrong, but still found information yeah. about it. That's really good. Nice like modeling of the possible yeah. outcomes and like being prepared yeah. for this. I think that's like a key I've seen across these AI agents. It's like, if you're going to make something that's autonomous, you have to kind of understand it the domain that it's going to be operating in to account That's for those. Well said, yeah. After the, all of the information is, has been scraped, we use the um, analyze the project module, which is also a custom workflow where we will summarize it and create a personalized uh, message. Let me show it as well. We get lots of content and just text from scraping the website. What we want to do next is somehow chunk this text and give it to the AI. Because what happens usually is if you scrape websites, you will get thousands and thousands of characters and you usually cannot feed it into AI because of the context limit. So what we want to do is get the content that was scraped and just chunk it up into smaller size chunks. What I'm doing here is just using Python to chunk it into 20,000 characters and then just returning all the chunks. In this case, it's only one item because we just scraped little information because the website didn't actually exist. What I'm doing next is just iterating on all of the chunks that were created and generating a summary using AI on each chunk. I'm just asking very, very simple and asking AI to just please summarize the given to content about the crypto project. We're iterating on them and we then aggregate all of the summaries. There's like 10, 15 summaries. And then we use a final chat GPT module where we generate a final summary of the project. This is output that we use to find the subcategory of the project or like the category of the crypto project. We have like a list of categories and their subcategories. And then just AI spits out the category that it thinks the project is. We then use it again, a custom tool to generate a personalized message to the script of project team on Google Sheets. Uh, we have a template for the personalized message and we have a list of vulnerabilities that I mentioned earlier for each subcategory. We take the subcategory, just map it in Google Sheets to find the vulnerabilities of this category and we feed it into AI to generate a personalized message. Essentially what this does, just find subcategory, gets the personalized message template and generates the personalization by using all of that. And then once everything is done, it updates everything on Google Sheets with the project name, all the social links that it found. We can see the classified category, the short summary. The summary is pretty big for a project that didn't have any information. All the overview page is pretty cool. And then it generates a personalization, which I can't really show because it's for a client, but just trust show me on that. No problem. I think What's really cool is there's complexity here, of course, but how I'm looking with 20 minutes into the recording and like you were able to explain this at a high level, we even show some prompts and some details in that time, like the relative simplicity to what is being done automatically. Like that's what I think is super impressive yeah. here. One question I had is I see you using open AI nodes in the workflow using open AI. Was that a conscious decision? Was it a client requirement? How did you decide on which models to use? Open AI is one of the cheapest models out there, especially if you're using like GPT-4 or mini on the open AI, on the API level, it's like almost free when you're using it, not on a big scale. That's kind of what we chose. I think personally that Claude is a little bit better than ChatGPT, especially in some creative tasks, but it's just way more expensive to run and ChatGPT just does the job. So that's why we chose it. That makes a lot of sense. That's a trend I'm seeing is I think I have used the metaphor before. Yes, maybe Claude will work for this use case, but are you using a flamethrower to light a candle? A flamethrower will definitely yeah. light the candle. It's just like a lighter will probably also. Exactly. Work. Yeah. What influenced your decision to use NAN to orchestrate this use case. I heard about NAN before. So I was using name.com for all of my automations, but then I heard about it. I checked it out. I looked into the plans and then I heard that you can self-host it. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Looked at the plans, looked at the capabilities of it and decided to switch because as a developer, I usually like to write some code, get some data and be able to just customize the workflows that I'm building. I cannot do it with most of the other automation software, name.com, Zapier, anything else. NAN, I can put a Python code blog, write some code to reformat my data as I want. I can build loops. I can use AI agents, which is also very, very cool. I can add memory, just use a bunch of different tools for building AI agents, which most of the other software 
Android tools just don't offer. And plus the fact that you can self-host it and actually use it you know, pretty much for free, only pay for the, for the hosting service. Mm -hmm. That's very, very cool. So firstly, guys, I do work for Enidan, but Nikita does not. And he just said that. And we're not paying him. He's on this call for free. Is yes. that correct, yes. Nikita? All right. So just, just for the record. That makes a ton of sense. One of the things I reflect on in Enidan is sometimes there's a few different ways to do something because it's flexible. When you were going through the example, you used a code node to limit the number of items coming out. We have like a no code limit node where you just kind of enter that through the UI. A lot of users sometimes they might not know about, it, especially like technical users are like, well, I'm more comfortable in code, which for us is like fine, whichever way you like to use it. but I think it was an ingenious way to use a few lines of code to get some more functionality. I'm still new to NAN. I, there's a lot of things that I need to learn how to use and learn different modules that there are because I wanted to write some code to remove duplicates from the data in the beginning that I showed to you. And then I saw that you have already this module that removes the duplicates and it makes it super easy to use. And then also the merge node that I don't have to write Python again. So there's just so much customization and so much capability that you can use with NAN. Very glad to hear that kind of feedback, as you yeah. can imagine. And I would say one really cool thing about using some of the generic chain nodes or agent nodes, like there's a, I don't know if you saw summarization chain and whatnot, you can swap out the model there. So what I'm doing very often is if I'm building a use case where I, I don't know if Gemini is going to be better here or this model or that model, I can quickly hot swap them and see for that step, which is the best model. Thanks so much for your time. Now you're building actively, I'm guessing you're ramping up to 2025. If folks like what they're seeing and want to follow along with your journey, where can they do that? I post, started posting a lot on X. So if you want to follow me there see some AI and automation content, I usually post some workflows that I've built, workflows for the clients and just AI and automation advice. You can follow me there. I have a YouTube channel as well, but not posting too much right now, but I will. I'm going to be explaining flows with NAN building AI agents, personal AI agents that I'm actually building for myself right now and more, more of a practical use cases. Very cool. Well, I'm excited for that. Join the club. It's very fun. Put out your videos on YouTube. And as a big thank you for your time, I'm going to send you one of these Flowgrammer shirts. Feel free to rep it on your show if you like. That's up awesome. to you. So Nikita, again, I really love interviewing folks that are like doing client work or solving real problems. Because again, if you got paid for that work, that's validation that it's useful, right? Like that's the oh, only validation sure. that it's useful. Next time you've got a cool use case to share let's hop on a call and let's share with the people the awesome stuff that you're working on sounds good sweet all right have a beautiful rest Dude, of your week Ciao. pretty cool right what i loved about this use case is that it shows how to use ai with not ai a lot of people are trying to paste ai everywhere and it doesn't make sense as you saw nikita's combining multiple sources for his insights some with puppeteer based technologies that have existed for years other times he's using ai again when it makes sense to this is the first crypto use case i've shown on the studio if you liked it and want to see more drop a comment and tell me what you'd like to see i myself am thinking of doing a crypto vault so basically we put a bunch of cash in a crypto wallet ai agent owns a private key and you have to convince the ai agent to give it to you or jailbreak it so to speak and then we document those jailbreaks publicly as we iterate it on each time and increment the pot definitely comment if you want me to do that one because i chatted with my finance team about it and they did not like the idea pro tip to anyone trying to convince finance to use crypto don't acknowledge that there's a small probability that the taliban in any case i'm max catch you next time and happy flow gramming.